As part of their enduring commitment to justice, equity, and expression, the Open Society Foundations are proud to sponsor Many Lumens. You're listening to Many Lumens, where we talk about and find meaning in the intersections of art, social change, and popular culture. I'm your host, Maori Carmel Holmes. For this episode, I'm joined by renowned painter Amy Sherald. Born in Columbus, Georgia, and now based in the New York City area, Amy documents contemporary African American experiences through arresting otherworldly figurative paintings. Amy was the first woman and first African American to ever receive the grand prize in the 2016 Outwin Buchiever Portrait Competition. In 2018, she was selected by Michelle Obama to paint her portrait as an official commission for the National Portrait Gallery. Amy's work is held in public collections such as the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, and many, many more. Amy talks about what life was like for her growing up in a small southern city and her process of self-exploration and honing her craft. We delve into the nuances of her artistic practice, her career trajectory, what life has been like since finding success, and finally, what we all want to know, when is Amy going to paint my portrait? I have been so wrong about a lot of people in my life. There are friends that I had who I swore were children of doctors and they were not. And I think about (laughs) who I thought you were when we met. And I did not think you were the child of a doctor when we were in our Arabic class. You were bald, pierced. It was the furthest thing from my mind, but you're like a real life Huxtable. And I just wanted you to share a little bit about your family and where you came from. I was born in Columbus, Georgia the daughter of a Dr. Amos Percy Sherrill III and uh, Geraldine Sherrill, who was born in Mobile, Mobile, Alabama. My dad was a dentist and one of the first Black dentists in Columbus. And um, like our family history there was was that we had the oldest Black-owned business in the city, and that was a barbershop named Sherrill's Barbershop that opened in in 1898. So yeah, we were, I guess, for all intents and purposes, like, I guess kind of like the Cosby show. And like I said, my dad was like disabled from Parkinson's disease. So Mm -hmm. he was only able to practice for like seven years. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we grew up in a black neighborhood. They wanted to make sure that we were like surrounded by people that look like us because we were going to private schools and like, you know, one of maybe two or three black kids in the school um, or or in that particular class, but for the most part in school. Yeah, and I grew up going to his office after school. His uncle had a mortuary right next door to the dental office, and I would go in there and, like, wait for bodies to jump or, you know, poke around at people's faces while they were being embalmed. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And uh, other than that, I feel like I had a pretty, you know, I had a pretty idyllic childhood. Like, you know, being that both of my parents were, like, born in the 1930s and 40s and had nothing but Jesus to like get life right. I feel like they did a pretty good job. <laughs> um, so, uh, Amy, a question that I have um, is what led to this kind of like, I call it a trap goth phase for you, you know, it was mm-hmm. like a mix of both. And what were you uh, searching for? Like when I shaved my head and like, yeah, did all that stuff. Yeah. I I needed to express myself. Like I had been under my parents' control for like all of my life. You know what I mean? So like my mom was like making decisions for us. She made decisions about what we wore, what we're going to eat, what time we went to bed. I mean, everything, you know, there was a part of me that wanted to like escape that identity of like being a doctor's daughter because, because you're in a small city and everybody knows who you are. Like, you know, I always felt like I had to, you know, put on, you know, and like, just, you know, be a certain way in public because there were these expectations. My mom would say, you know, don't be uncouth. Mm. But I think that's also what I thought an artist was. I think at that time I was obsessed with like Courtney Love or like the the grunge scene. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like when I found that scene, like I found my tribe of people like at that point in my life. Mm -hmm. So I think it was just because I hadn't had the opportunity to ever really express myself and express my personality 
And then I got there and I started to see people that were like fully formed, you know, and to all of this coolness. And um, I just decided to join, you know. Do you know what your parents wanted for your future? What they thought you were going to grow up to do? They wanted me to be a doctor. My dad wanted me to take over his practice. And I'm not going to say I wasn't smart enough, but I definitely was like scientifically challenged. But yeah, ideally it it would be like a brain surgeon or (laughs) something (laughs) like that, which, you know, had I stuck to it, I'd be poor. I would be poor, I guess, because at this point I make more money than a brain surgeon. So (laughs) I'm glad I I stuck to my guns. (laughs) Subtle flex. (laughs) That's awesome. Um, Can you talk about your relationship with your mom today? It's pretty amazing. She's a cool lady. Like she's 85. Like we kind of get to have fun now. She's a bit of a lush, you know, like (laughs) if you're eating something or drinking something, she's a like, she's like a, I don't mind if I do kind of (laughs) lady. I would say we're a lot of like personality wise. We're like, get it done type of people. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think I learned that from her. I learned how to take care of people from her. And we, we just have fun now. I mean, like, I took her shopping a couple of weeks ago, got her some new clothes, got her some tortoise shell glasses, and, like, in my opinion, changed her life. Because she <laughs> went from, like, granny to, like, I don't know, whatever you call, like, a hot lady that's 85. But <laughs> um, <laughs> so she's cool. I say she looks like she like she belongs to me now. <laughs> And get out of those Target jo- uh, jogging suits with like embroidery on the chest, you know, some like <laughs> random embroidery and like gold or something. So she's, you know, she's cute. And she was always like a fashion person, mm-hmm. you know, like I had jet magazines of like her in the magazine, like volunteering for like SNCC or something. And she would have on this like super cute outfit and I hear it being ways. And, you know, she was, um, she was a little hot mama when she was growing up. Now that you are like really, really famous, who do you lean on for guidance and to keep you grounded? I lean on my partner, my life partner, Kevin. I lean on, you want their names? Like no, I lean no, on Deborah Roberts. <laughs> I lean on Jordan Gatsdale. <laughs> I lean on Zoe Charlton. Um, and they're all, you know, female painters, right? Like we're all artists, I think majority of like the things that could go awry in our lives now would be like connected to our career Mm -hmm. but yeah there's probably in like Kalita Kalita I've known since Spellman um and I'm probably forgetting somebody but that's my emergency phone call people when you're feeling insecure you're like oh this painting's stupid or you know what I mean like I can send them a picture of something I'm working on and be like what do you think about this and they can kind of like get my mind back on track. Mm -hmm. I want to move into talking about your artistic practice. And so wanted to ask you about how you settled on painting portraits as opposed to doing something more abstract, you know, and non-figurative. Life, I guess. I think, um, I think growing up, like that's all I really thought art was because that's all I really saw. I didn't know who Andy Warhol was and I know who Jackson Pollock was and you know, I didn't know who, I really didn't know who anybody was. Cause my parents weren't li- like into the arts in that way. My dad was into jazz and my mom, you know, they would go see plays and stuff. But, but I mean, looking back, I think I'm, you know, I'm, I'm drawn to, I'm drawn to people. And I'm saying that as an introvert. So when I say I'm drawn to people, I mean, like, I like to look at them, but I don't want to interact. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's just fascinating. Like I'm just fascinated with faces and I'm fascinated with the human body and, like when I didn't think that I was going to be able to make enough money to be an artist, I was going to be a medical illustrator. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking like, wow, they make like $55,000 a year. That's a lot of money, you know? So I think that's, that's why, but it was just like a natural attraction. And maybe, you know, if I was born in another decade, it wouldn't be like that, but that's the way it was for me as a seventies baby. Yeah. I was thinking I found some like old photos that I have of you um, from Atlanta that are like, you know, this previous style that you had, I guess, coming out of undergrad where oh, there, you Lord. painted these uh-uh. like, <laughs> it, was <so> bad. <laughs> it wasn't bad, but I just wanted a lot of these figures looked like you. And so I was curious in this 
you know, the current style that you're painting in, have you considered doing a self-portrait? I have. I just don't know. What's holding me back is like, I don't know what to wear. Mm. Because like so much of the of my work is about the clothes. I don't know what I want to wear and like how I want to present myself to the world. And that's what's holding me back. But I think at some point in the next two years, I, I will probably do a self-portrait and I'll call you to pick out my outfit. How about that? <laughs> that's a deal. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> what What is the uniform of, of the moment? Overalls. Okay. And not just any overalls. Of course not. Chloe Kardashian, good American overalls. Oh, do you like her stuff? Yes. I mean, because I'm tall and all of her stuff is like high waisted and it fits me perfectly. Interesting. Okay. I know. I just, I didn't, when I first started purchasing from Good American, I didn't know it was her brand. <laughs> but, um, I, I mean, I didn't. <laughs> and then somebody was like, what? You buying Good American? And I'm like, what's wrong with that? She's like, it's Chloe Kardashian. But then I'm, I'm still like, so what's wrong with that? But yeah, they're great. That's my uniform right now. White t-shirt and some denim overalls. Oh, I need to finish this visual. What, um, what do you have on your feet? <laughs> I have a compression sock on one leg and I'm barefoot on the other. <laughs> oh, that ruined the look, but. <laughs> but without this, like how I arrived was with some brown and cream, like cow print, um, brother belly, mm. um, like, uh, Birkenstock. They're not Birkenstocks, but like they're like the the slide in Birkenstock, but like with the covered toe, like a mule, you know? Oh, those sound adorable. Yeah, they're they're, so, they're very cute. <laughs> um, is there anyone you're dreaming to have sit for you? It was Cicely Tyson, mm. and I asked her by way of like a second degree connection, and she was like, "Why?" <laughs> <laughs> and then she wanted me to write her a letter, "Why?" And then I got busy getting ready for a show, and now she's no longer with us. Rest in peace. Sometimes I look at Samuel Jackson and I want to paint Samuel Jackson. Ooh. Yeah. That's the, he's the, he's the only person that's like, like stayed afloat all Mm. these years, you know? Yeah. That, that I like, if I had the opportunity, I would, I would paint him as a, as a character. Mm Mm-hmm. So one of the things that, um, you know, people have talked about that is really beautiful about your work is that it's thinking about, Um, the kind of epic banal of Black life. And you have been, I think, exclusively portraying Black people. And if that's correct, I was curious if you think you'll ever paint non-Black folks. No, I won't. But yes, I have. I painted my um, wonderful friend, Valeska, and she's the only white person I've ever painted. But she's like so worthy of it because she's an amazing woman. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, I don't really... I don't foresee myself doing that because I don't think it's necessary. Yeah. Because yeah. when I'm, when I'm looking at my paintings, I'm looking at myself, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So like, there's a, there's like a connection there that, I mean, I had it when I was painting her and I don't, I don't know, but yeah, it's like my, my work. Um, yeah. It's, it's not, it's not the, it's not the focus. And um, I feel like I will be doing the culture a disservice if I, not just like made a painting of a of a person that that wasn't black, but just because sometimes I think about like these different scenarios and I wonder like group paintings of like different, you know, ethnicities. Cause at one point I photographed um my friend Jennifer who is um Chinese, but I never ended up painting her. Mm-hmm. So I'm like had the inclination, but I don't have the narrative, so I didn't move forward with it. Um, well, sort of speaking of narrative, I also wanted to ask you about the naming convention. Um, in a lot of your works, you're referencing primarily Black and Asian writers or philosophers in the titles. And just mm-hmm. curious where this practice developed. I mean, you know, you read these books by these geniuses like, you know, Gwendolyn Brooks and Lucille Clifton. And I feel like sometimes I'll look at my paintings and I think they're they're like a direct illustration of of the moment that they were giving us in the poem. Mm -hmm. 
it just kind of worked out, you know, like I would just be reading it for the sake of reading it. And I would like read a line and I'm like, wow, that would make a great title. Mm -hmm. And it it wouldn't be a whole line necessarily, but just like, you know, maybe a part of a line or something like that. And then I would like add something to it or, you know, tweak it a little bit. But I relished in the connection that the present was having with the past. And um, it was just a way for me to like, you know, make, draw this this linear line from me straight to them and kind of carry them with me. Mm -hmm. So do you kind of like collect them, um, like write them down and collect titles or? I do. Whenever I come across one, I do write it down because sometimes I do think of the title before the painting. You know, I just, I see something. I'm like, that's a, that's a great title for a painting. Haven't made the painting yet, but I'm going to save it. So um, I do have a collection of like, little tidbits that I can reflect on when I'm trying to come up with something. Pivoting just slightly, I was thinking about, you know, how tough it is to make a career in the art world. And Mm -hmm. you stuck it out for a really long time, like longer than most people have the strength for. And was just curious, you know, what kept you going? Like, why were you so confident that you had something special? Where did that confidence come from, if you know? I don't know if it was confidence or just the right amount of denial <laughs> <laughs> that everything's going to be okay. <laughs> I, you know, I just, I literally left myself no other option. Mm-hmm. So it's like either I, I fail at this or um, I make it happen. So I had to make it happen because I didn't have a plan B. You, so you didn't have a set point either when you would decide to like move on? No, I wasn't ever, I don't think. Yeah. Because every time I thought maybe it's time, like something else will happen. Mm-hmm. And I never really seriously thought it was time. You know, I would just go into like deep manifestation mode and try to create what I needed, you know? Yeah. But I mean, it's it was tough because the older you get, the more you're like, this isn't cute anymore. <laughs> you know, it's like your 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 friends are kind of like, poor Amy, like she's waiting tables and she's. 39 years old and she's just a waitress she thinks she's gonna be an artist but i mean like at 39 years old you know what i mean like i'm I'm, like i'm sure those kind of conversations were happening Mm -hmm. but i knew i don't know but then but then i have a deep knowing i think we all like we all have the answers all the answers that we need right like they say that it's like you have all the answers that you need Mm -hmm. and um i did have a deep knowing that i was moving towards my destiny Mm -hmm. How has your practice shifted now that you have been successful? Not much because I made a deliberate decision for it not to. Mm -hmm. So like really the only thing that changed is like, I don't have to make my own stretchers anymore. Mm -hmm. I hired an extra assistant. That's it. Like I'm making bigger paintings now because I'm in a bigger space. Mm -hmm. But as far as like my production in general, you know, like I only want to make eight to 10 paintings like every year and a half, every two years, you know, I don't, I'm not like a, I'm a slow painter, but I'm not prolific in that way because I like to take my time. I like to be with the work sometimes without working on it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like, honestly, like not a lot has changed because of that. I mean, like I said, I didn't want it to. Yeah. No, I, I respect that. And I can't imagine how hard that is at the same time, (laughs) just sort of witnessing it from the outside. Um, Yeah. I I also know there's that moment where people around you change, even if you're trying not to. Yeah, Yeah. I did. I like doubled down on like all the friends like yourself that I've known for, you know, over 20 years. I was like, no new friends. These are my friends. And if I haven't known you for more than 10 years, then like, sorry. You know what I mean? (laughs) I got like, you know, cause those are the people that, you know, like no matter what, like, you don't talk to them all the time, but you know, they're going to show up when you need them. So, and they're the people that are always going to tell you when you look stupid Mm -hmm. and tell you when you're great and you can believe them. Yeah. So I think that's the first thing I did was like clean house a little bit and, and claim those people and hold on to those people as like, and surround myself with them, like, you know, as, as my circle. Is there room for magic in your art making? Absolutely. Um, I guess that's why I don't really plan my shoots 
that's the one thing that I can allow to be organic and I don't have to, you know, that I don't purposely control Mm -hmm. is um, like planning poses or, you know, anything like that. I think the, the magic happens like within a second or two and then, you know, you get your shot and you know, that's your shot. And I think it's magic. What I consider magic is like what, like the energy transfer between the model of myself and then myself and the canvas. Mm-hmm. There's something that happens there energetically, I guess, that I, I can't really put my finger on. Mm-hmm. There is magic in like the production of, of imagery. Um, so I do feel that when I'm making making a painting, I feel like I'm not alone in, in the process. You know what I mean? Like there's when my intents go up and I see something that I want to pour myself into and create, you know, I feel like there's a force out there that's like guiding me mm-hmm. and um, connecting me to the right people to make this work. You know, I'm drawn to, you know, specific type of person. They're a little bit asymmetrical and a little bit worn. They kind of have a weight, a weight to their spirit in a way. Well, this explains why you haven't painted me yet, because my face is perfectly right. symmetrical. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm as light as a feather. No, I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. That's um, hilarious. <laughs> um, I was asking the question because I think about um, in film and theater, I've heard and experienced these kind of like otherworldly kind of metaphysical occurrences, you know, in production and heard about them with musicians as well. And so I was curious, you know, like I I personally had the experience of like editing half awake and not remembering what I did and then coming back (laughs) to something kind of brilliant. And I wasn't sure if you ever had that experience. Like, have you been painting in kind of a fever dream or, you know, not remembering a particular stroke and then been like, ah, that was perfect. Uh, No, I haven't. But I had moments early on, like, I was already in Baltimore and I was already out of grad school and I was, you know, searching for the work that I was going to make found, you know, came up with these ideas and which became this body of work that I have now. But, um, I would have these moments where I would feel a flash of my future Mm. and it sounds crazy. I don't really know how to describe it, but it was like, a curtain was open briefly and then it would close Mm. and then I would see it and I would feel this like, you know, be like overcome with emotion and joy and happiness, just like a deep gratitude. And I don't know, like, that's also what kept me going is because like, I would have these instances of, I don't even know, like maybe it's like, I always say like my brother who is, who is no longer with us on this planet. Like maybe he's telling me something or, Mm-hmm. I remember one time I, when I was applying to go to Maryland Institute College of Art, because you told me about it, <laughs> um, I got interviewed and I thought I had made it in, but I made it in this like first alternate pick. So somebody had to decide not to go to the program. Mm. And I remember um, getting that news and walking into the bathroom in my apartment and looking in the mirror. And then I heard a voice that was in my voice that said everything's going to be okay but it was like a deep voice mm. <laughs> <laughs> so i thought it was my maybe my dad cuz like he had just recently passed like within like a couple of months mm-hmm. but that's those are the kind of magical moments that have um you know like really carried me like the days that i wanted to just like quit my life and just be a greeter at walmart <laughs> like it was those moments that really kept me like waking up and like just just like pushing forward you know as I'm like there's something out there if I can't believe in myself today then like whatever that was is believing in me right now for me you know yeah thank you for sharing that my last question of this section is just to ask you is film in your future you know think about Steve McQueen and of course Warhol um you know I know you love Wes Anderson wondering if you've thought about making a film yourself I have, um, but I am not confident enough to do it yet. And I think, I'm not sure if it's going to be stupid. (laughs) (laughs) So I just like not going to do it, you know, (laughs) 
But at some point, if it makes sense, I would like to do it. I just know it like film is really expensive. And at the time that I did have the balls to do it, um, you know, I was talking to somebody about a budget and they're like, you need about $30,000. I'm like, well, that's not going to happen right now. So <laughs> Cause that's like a low budget, you know? Yeah. But I mean, just short films though, like not necessarily a movie, but just like a short film, like, like five minutes, like short. Yeah. Like a film short, not a short film, a film short. <laughs> Seen is a journal of film and visual culture focused on Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities globally, with essays, reviews, interviews, and more from critics, artists, and other luminaries of color. It's the publication Harper's Bazaar calls a must-read for anyone with a serious film interest. Subscribe at scene.blackstarfest.org. You're listening to Many Lumens. Now back to my conversation with Amy Sherald. I want to go back just a little bit and ask you what made you choose Clark Atlanta? You know, it's not a school that I think of uh, as being known for their visual art program, but I know you met some impactful mentors there like Arturo Lindsay. And I was just curious if you could talk about, you know, why you chose it and about your time in Atlanta and how it shaped your work. I was just trying to get away from my mama. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, I just, I just, want to get out of Columbus, Georgia. Um, and I had friends at Clark. So I was like, I'm just going to go to Clark. Mm-hmm. And it was as simple as that. But little did I know I was walking into my destiny, even though <laughs> I was making like a half ass decision about my life. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it, it turned out to be the right decision, you know, because I, I did meet Arturo Lindsay, who was like my painting instructor. And um, he did have a great, a great influence over my life and gave me a lot of direction and great advice and mentorship. Um, and he was like the first living artist that I ever met. So it was, it was, um, enthralling to, to see that and, you know, to, to, to work for him and help him assist him in making his work and, um, putting it out in the world. Uh, I got, you know, I was able to live vicariously through him and through those opportunities, I, you know, started to come into my own as like a, um, a, uh, a painter and a thinker. And what about just Atlanta at the time when I think about the mid to late nineties and the intersection of like Hotep and hip hop, (laughs) you know, and Hotep, (laughs) Nag Champa, (laughs) you know, I mean, like, I was a bouncer during that time. So like, that's when the Olympics came, right? Mm -hmm. Atlanta was amazing then. It was like Club Kaya. It was Yin Yang. It was, it was like a special place. I mean, like there's very, I mean, what I I feel like when I talk about life in Atlanta at that time, I I sound like I'm name dropping, but I'm like literally just like talking about a regular day where like you pay $8 to go to Club Velvet and, you stand in next to Biggie Smalls before he gets up on stage to perform and there's like 40 people there. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it was just the coolest city and it's very different now. I don't, I don't relate to it in the same way, but um, yeah, it was, just, it was an amazing time. Like, I don't know, like the people that I met there at that time, like working at the rim shop, that was crazy. This was um, Eric Sermon's rim shop, right? Right. <laughs> and you know, like that was the whole thing. And like being introduced to that world was interesting to say the least. Like, I don't want to like get into it because there's a lot of good stuff and a lot of bad stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Atlanta was, was given every, everybody life. Like even like the, the drag scene, you know, like going to Loretta's and, and watching drag shows and, you know, grateful for like, the waitresses at the IHOP that will like give us free food because <laughs> we were in there every day, like three times a day because we didn't have any money. Yeah. You know, just everybody was just like in their element, doing their thing, like living their best life. And um, it was like no big deal. You know what I mean? It was, it was a, a cool time. Um, so I, I want to ask what made you choose Micah for grad school? You did, Mary. (laughs) I didn't make you choose it. I told you about it. You did make me choose it. 
<laughs> You're like, this is what you need to do. Listen to me. I'm a Torian and I know what you need. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, ma'am. And I applied. <laughs> and I ended up going to Micah. I would have never ended up there. Like, I don't know where I would have ended up, but Micah was like the perfect suggestion. But what so, what like, was attractive to you about it? You know, like... I mean, Mary, my life was so... I mean, my life has been so half-assed. Like, <laughs> what was attractive to me about it was the fact that the deadline was March 1st and not January. <laughs> I mean, I needed time to make the work to get into the school, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's the funny part. It's like, I didn't even try a lot. I mean, like, I wanted to be an artist, but I was just like, la, 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 mm -hmm. moving through my life. Do, 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 do. <laughs> I'm going to go to Micah. You know what I mean? And it's just ignorance is bliss. Yeah. Because I would have never applied there had I known, like, had I seen the work of the artists that were there, mm -hmm. I would have never applied but I'm like, I'm the bomb and I'm going to go to grad school. But yeah, it was, it was that random, but you know, we're all guided by uh, something. So it, it all worked out in the end. Yeah. How did um, being in school, you know, and doing an MFA transform your practice? It's really when I got in touch with like my, you know, intellectual acumen and like being introduced to philosophy and things like that, that I somehow missed in college. You know, my father had recently passed and like trying to re recommit myself to like Christianity at like the age of 30 and then being like, this is not working for me. I mean, discovering like Nietzsche and like, you know, like I was really into just like opening up books and like deep diving into like so much information. I just, uh, you know, I was voracious. And, um, and I think I heard you say this, maybe either you or Zadie Smith, but the more words you have, the, the, the bigger your ability to be able to like dissect things in life. And, you know, to me, like, that's part of, like, my creative process. Like, I don't start a painting with words, but I fill my brain up with, like, all this stuff. And somehow it finds its way and it starts to make sense. Mm -hmm. and, and and it finds its way into into the work. I don't know if that was but me, that, but I love that you think it was. <laughs> yeah, it was. I think it was you, because you, you were talking about going back to school. Mm. Okay. You wanted to like go back for a degree and you said something about like needing more, like not needing more words, but you just wanted more words. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like you wanted to learn more. Mm -hmm. um, but I might be making that up. Who knows? <laughs> it's, it's possible. <laughs> it's so possible. Um, <laughs> can you talk about um, how Baltimore, you know, being there, what that, what impact that had on you? It was my introduction to myself, um, you know, like my first time living outside of Georgia, my first time like not living in a city that um, had a lot of black wealth, you know, all of that coupled with going to grad school, I just like, just really grew up really fast. And I think I, it really made me into like a fully a, a fully formed human mm -hmm. um discovering all the things that i didn't know you know i mm -hmm. think that's what i became aware of when i went to grad school it's like wow there's a lot i don't know and it's just a real city i mean like it's gritty it's wonderful and it it feeds it fed me energetically and so many faces there like i i still go back to baltimore to look for some of my models because there's just something you know like there's a there's just something there that I like that I'm able to draw from. Yeah, I mean it's yeah, that's that's pretty much that's yeah. it. I know you love food. You worked in restaurants for a long time and you're responsible for some of my own exploits. I remember running over to Soul Veg after class. Um oh, yeah. but I feel like we've definitely talked about food in almost every conversation we've ever had. 
And I was curious if you've been exploring much in COVID times, you know, or have you been cooking? We were cooking and then we were in Atlanta and then we moved back. We like came back up to New York when it opened up. And then we were so tired of cooking. We hired somebody (laughs) to come cook for us. (laughs) But, you know, like the one thing I'm obsessed with now is collard greens. So like I eat a pot of collard greens every week and I have for like almost eight months. And I'm like never tired of it. Mm. Um, I know you're also an avid exerciser. I don't even know if that's the right word, but I know it's another consistent thing that you talk about in the ways that I talk about astrology. And I was curious Mm -hmm. uh, where that impulse for, you know, athletics and exercise comes from. Um, Jack LaLanne and Richard Simmons. (laughs) I mean, I was always up early and like there was nothing on TV but those guys. And um, I would like do my aerobic exercises in the morning, like, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade. And I just like being active. I think it's just it's just part of my makeup. Like I like running. I like the solitude of running. I like a booty. So I like squatting. (laughs) My booty went from a cantaloupe to a grapefruit. So I got some work to do. (laughs) Yeah. I think it helps me work out my, you know, frustrations or like stress. And honestly, I guess I'm just vain and I want to look good. Mm -hmm. You know, I just want to look good like whatever I think looks good, but I I haven't worked out in almost a year. Oh, wow. (laughs) This is the first time in my life. Like maybe I worked out, maybe I worked out six times Mm -hmm. this year. It's like once work picked up, then I started prioritizing just like getting to the studio and that sucks. Mm. So I always say like, all right, I'm going to start this week. I'm going to start this week. And then it's like a year later and I haven't done it. And I bought a Peloton and then like now it's in storage. I'm trying to like give it away. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I'll come back to it. I think I'm going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Like I'm 48. I just stopped exercising, but then I also just started eating bacon <laughs> almost every day, every day. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so I feel like I have a little bit of time to like, fuck up my body and like I can still get back on the horse. <laughs> um, there's something I'm sure I've told you this before, but um, just to talk about it, you have like a giant sized heart. And I think about you and another close friend who has a heart condition. And the two of you are like the most optimistic and loving people that I know. And it's like this odd turn of affairs that the universe has bestowed upon you, you know? Mm-hmm. And I know you talked a lot about having had a transplant publicly, but I'm curious what changed for you after your procedure. Did you make any new commitments to yourself or did you, you know, sort of have any um, goals or promises that you made? No. um, That's funny. Everybody's always disappointed with that answer. (laughs) They're like, how did you change? And I'm like, I didn't, I didn't change. I was already perfect. Um, (laughs) I mean, like, I thought I was going to die, you know, by the time I was 39. So I was like, you know, like I had come to terms with that. And once you come to terms with that, it's like living is easy. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I survived was like, oh, okay, cool. Like now I can get on with it. You know what I mean? Like I can get on with my life and like get on with this journey of becoming an artist and like, you know, pursuing my dreams. Um. But yeah, I was already that person, I think, because I was faced with my own mortality at like at my diagnosis at 30. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was just like, well, if I got 10 years, then I'm going to kill it. So I, I did everything. I took risk and I, um, you know, let go of stuff and, you know, pick and chose my battles and just like really focus and put my energy on those things that I wanted to come to fruition Mm -hmm. and did not put my energy into the stuff that, you know, didn't deserve it. Yeah. Um, It's been a real joy to watch you play dress up in the public eye and, you know, sort of be in air quotes dressed by a stylist. And I was curious if you had any inkling toward fashion or garments showing up in your work beyond the, the canvas, you know, like an actual life. 
Um, like, do I want to paint something that somebody else made? Maybe, or I don't know if you've been asked to collaborate, you know, on a fashion line oh, or, yeah, you know, I have, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of things that I, I, you know, like, I don't know where, whether anybody says this out loud, but there's a lot of things that I do right now because of this, like, you know, I, it's not a moment. I don't want to call it that because that almost gives it like makes it finite, but this, uh, the, the attention and well deserved attention that black artists are getting now, mm-hmm. you know, you get asked and you want to do it because it's something that's fun. Like there's stuff that I wanted to do, you know, for the Met Gala. I got to ask to do something for the Met Gala, but there's a, I think it's easy for, for artists and it works for some artists actually it's easy for artists to kind of like dip their foot in these different areas but somehow for some reason and it doesn't make sense to me it it could make you appear to be like a less serious artist Mm -hmm. i'm still trying to understand that dynamic but i think the, the the really serious curators are looking at you and they could look at you differently, I guess. You know, if you're like, yeah, I'm making this, I'm doing this thing with, you know, Urban Outfitters or something like that. Um, it's it's just, I'm still trying to figure it out. I don't even have the words for it. I don't know. But <laughs> there are collaborations that I want to do. And I feel like they will naturally happen. And I feel like eventually I'll be able to do them because I'll be further along in my career. And like, you know, I could make decisions that won't, have such an impact on me long term. Mm-hmm. Um, like I really want to do something with Tom Brown. Mm. Um, I really would love to. I think he's the main person because his his work really resonates with me because I feel like his people are my people. Mm-hmm. Like when he dresses his models, my people are the same kind of people. Yeah. But I haven't had a lot of time to think about that. I think I read this or I heard Ta-Nehisi um, Coates talk about this in some article or something. But he just said, when you get famous, people start asking you to do things. You have no, like, no training, <laughs> no background. Yeah. In. And he's like, you could do anything. And he was like saying, you know, but you shouldn't. And I was just curious. I was sure someone yeah. had like approached you Excuse about me. a line or, you know. I agree. I agree. Yeah, I've been approached. I've been approached for a line, like, but I, it, I don't know what I'm doing, and I'm like, if it doesn't make sense, yeah, then I can't do it. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. It's so true. Like that, people want like, like commentary on like critical race theory. You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> you want me to be a news pundit on MSNBC and talk about like. There's a million people. There's like a thousand other people that would be better than me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like why you want to ask me to do that? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I stay in my lane and my lane is making paintings mm-hmm. and that's what got me here. And that's what's going to keep me here. Yeah. I I wanted to move on to talk a little bit about um, like your current life. Um, one of the things that's been so lovely to witness, you know, on social media, I think if you know you or if, even if you don't, but with hashtag the Shimbertons and just watching your love flourish, I was curious how you met Kevin and what has changed in your life because of his influence. Um, we met about 14 years ago through a mutual friend. And I, I thought he was really cute, but I felt like I felt like he was like not ready. Mm. So, you know, 14 years went past. He he came to a show and we just connected at that time. And then we've just been connected ever since. Mm -hmm. Um, And he's changed my life a lot. He's changed my life a lot. I mean, I had to get used to like, being with an extrovert <laughs> I was like wow I have to talk all the time now like I'm tired all the time now um 
but yeah, I think because we're so different, I think it, we're complementary because we, we live in two different worlds and, um, it sounds crazy, but I'm fascinated with his world and what he does and like, you know, banks and hedge funds and all that. And Mm -hmm. then he has a foot in my world, you know, and had a foot in my world before he met me. So I felt like we had an understanding, you know, like I didn't have to explain my, I didn't have to explain myself to him. You know what I mean? Like I dated guys that didn't know anything about art and like, that's just really hard to do. Um, can you talk about what you're working on right now? Not that you need to be working on anything, but, um, do you have a show coming up? You know, like what, what is sort of next? I do have a show coming up in London at Hauser and Worth in October. Mm -hmm. Um, it's going to open the week of freeze and that's what my focus is now. So that's what I'll be doing until August. And then I'll start day drinking once the work (laughs) (laughs) shifts. You and your mother. I love it. Yes, me and my mama. <laughs> um, do you think you'll ever return to the South? Like, is that a desire of yours to live uh, I will. in Georgia? Yeah, mm-hmm. I will. For sure. I don't want to raise a kid up here. And if we have a family, I think the South is like the easiest place to do it. Mm. That was my next question was what you wanted to conquer next. It was there, you know, buying a house or having kids is that on the I horizon? bought a house already. Like I bought my first condo. Oh, okay. And now I'm waiting. Like we've gone through a home study and we're in the process of like looking for a child to adopt. That's mm-hmm. like between the age of like three and 12. So if anybody knows any pregnant teenagers, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so like, that's the next thing I want to conquer is like becoming a mom. Yeah. Yeah. And I was okay not having kids. And I was okay being a spinster. But then I met Kevin and I'm like, I want to have a kid. Like, I want to be a mom. So um, I'm waiting for my soulmate of a child. I got my soulmate of a dog, August Wilson. So now I'm waiting (laughs) on (laughs) my soulmate of a child to come find us. Wait, how are George and Weezy going to feel about that? I mean, you know, August (laughs) is always going to be my baby. (laughs) I mean, how did I end up with a dog? that's a Virgo. Like that's just, <laughs> it's just random. Yeah. And we're both alike. Like we're at home and August will be in the bedroom by himself in the dark for like two hours. Mm-hmm. When stuff is, when stuff gets like too noisy in the living room, he's yeah. a funny guy. <laughs> um, can you talk about what you do to wind down? So I wind down every night. I take a bath. Mm-hmm. I take a salt bath every night and I watch something like, the Kardashians, Blackish, or like um, Bridgerton, mm-hmm. or Bling Empire, just something that my mind can just escape. Yeah. Something that's like so mindless that Kevin turns his nose up. At, he's like, I can't believe watching that. <laughs> I'm like, I know you're too good for it, but I'm not, you know. <laughs> um, and my last question, most importantly, um, because the world is asking, is when are we getting a portrait of me? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, 2024. 2024. Yeah, right. I've been waiting for 10 hey. years. I'm going to, I'm going to, at minimum, I'm going to photograph you. <laughs> and then we're going to like find the painting and, and the, we're going to, we're going to figure it out. I know you're waiting for me to get in supermodel shape. You can just tell us. It's cool. No, that's not it at all. Like you're perfect <laughs> just the way you are. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Amy was really I'm 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 happy to be a part of this I think it's a I, I don't know I think you're amazing so I think everything you do is amazing starting with Black Star so you know I'm I big I, I'm always talking about you so your ears should constantly be burning well thank you boo boo I really yeah you're I welcome. just can't say thank you enough I'll talk to you soon I don't want to rush off but somebody just got to my studio and I do have to go okay <laughs> well I'm glad we're done <laughs> yes <laughs> All right. I'll call you on my drive home. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. You can find Amy on Instagram at a Sherald and see her incredible work at amysherald.com.
This season of Many Lumens is brought to you by Open Society Foundations. It is produced by Black Star Projects in partnership with Row Home Productions. The host and executive producer of Many Lumens is me, Maori Carmel Holmes. This episode was produced by Alex Lewis and Dallas Taylor. Associate producers are Irit Reinheimer and Farah Rahman. Managing producer is Alex Lewis. Executive editor is John Myers. Our music supervisor is David Little Dave Adams, Black Star's Music and Cinema Fellow, supported by the Pop Culture Collaborative. Our theme song was composed by Vijay Mohan and remixed by Little Dave. This episode features music by Ian. Sending you light and see you next time. Thank you.